Well, I want to welcome everybody. We're going to start in about 10 seconds just to give a few others a chance to sign in. We have quite an attendance here, so we're really happy that this has become such a popular event. We certainly enjoy it. So as the numbers increase, looking good, a few more. This looks, this, it makes me feel like this is a telethon where people are donating. I wish that was the case, but okay, we're at a magic number here. So yeah, we're gonna begin. Uh, I am grateful uh, for the graphic support uh, provided by NASIO this year. I mean, this is a forecast, an outlook of the year ahead. And this is something that Doug and I have been doing for at least 13 years. And it's scary because we're kind of losing count, but this is we know this is the 13th year. There may have been another one. But we do this every year in January. And this is an opportunity uh, for Doug Robinson, as you know, uh, the CEO, the head of uh, NASIO, and myself, uh, who heads PTI, now we're part of Fusion Learning Partners, where we give our best guesses of the future. We we couch that with some of the research that each of our organizations have done. But I think when all is said and done, you'll have a pretty good idea of at least how we see things and our members see things uh, through the coming year. Uh, so with that, yeah, it's cloudy skies with a mix of moderation and a lot of AI. And there's going to be a lot of that, at least in my part of the presentation. I'm sure the same is with Doug. So it's it's just an honor, Doug, every year to be able to do this with you. So I, I turn it to you, sir. Uh, the same. And uh, and thank you, Alan. Let me uh, grab my slides here real quick. And we will uh, we will begin. Uh, and uh, I think, as, as Alan said, this is a forecast. Uh, so we're not going to do any any predictions, and if we did, uh, I can tell you they would not be uh, they would not be accurate given what we're seeing certainly in in uh, in 2023. Uh, so let me let me go ahead and get to the beginning here, and let's talk about the the state of the states. And my focus again will be on state governments, and it will be on the perspective of the state CIOs and their organization. Uh, that's who we represent. Uh, 54 members, the states, territories, and the District of Columbia. So my presentation and briefing today and my remarks will all be supported by a number of our research products that we've released in the last few months, particularly the state a CIO survey report, which we released in October. And in that report, as we do each year, we always ask for some forecast from the state CIO. So we had another remarkable response rate with that study. Uh, and that survey, uh, 49 states completed it in full. And so we have uh, with their CIOs. And so we have some really good information from uh, wide ranging perspectives. So uh, we will jump into that and we will talk uh, supported by uh, those, uh, probably the most important thing you'll see today that will give you a perspective of the topics, which is the state CIO top 10 for 2024. Uh, we have been doing the top 10 since 2007 was our first year to release that. So we have a significant amount of longitudinal data about the CIOs and their party strategies and, and, and management processes and really what their priorities are going to be for the year. So this is an individual uh, perspective. It's a forced choice ballot that NASIO puts out and the CIOs provide their perspective on a wide range of topics and they vote on those. And for the first time, uh, we had a tie for number one, uh, which was very unusual, again, historic position. Uh, where we, we we had cybersecurity, uh, again, 10 consecutive years in the number one slot uh, tied with digital government and digital services. And we've seen this gap closing over the last few years as digital services uh, really has has moved up. But I think the, 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 the outcome of the pandemic and some of the challenges that states faced and some of the re realities that they uh, that they saw during the pandemic and the fact that citizens uh, were, uh, somewhat frustrated. Uh, they didn't have the same experience uh, that they might have as a consumer. And so that really kind of bolstered the effort to really focus on that. In addition, our 2023 presidential initiative, which I'll mention in a few moments, was on improving that digital experience. So I think a little bit of a momentum uh, coming out of our, our annual conference in October. Uh, these votes were cast in late November and early December of 2023, and we asked those CIOs to, again, to prognosticate and forecast what those priorities are going to be. So I'm going to touch on a, a few of these. Uh, certainly, we're going to touch on artificial intelligence and Gen AI and RPA, because that rocketed up to number three, uh, having not been on the list in previous iterations. So it's the first time that it's appeared on the list. 
it's unusual for a kind of a technology and a technology stack uh, to be on this list at this level. Uh, but again, I think the uh, both the, the promise and the peril of AI, as we'll talk, uh, I'm sure, during the afternoon, uh, moved it up to uh, to number three. And again, part of this uh, session today is about modernization and AI. And we're seeing, again, modernization as a solid number four. Workforce actually dropped a few slots. Uh, broadband moved up because I'm recognizing the bead funding and other federal initiatives that's going to take more of a priority during 2024. Uh, and cloud services uh, continues to to drop on the list as these cloud, as we see from our other studies, a uh, cloud has become essentially business as usual, and it's become part of the the overall strategy and the operations of the state C organization. So it is not getting the high priority any longer because it's simply standard practice for uh, for the states. Uh, identity and access management continues to have a high degree of interest, particularly coupled with the need for more security and the need for enhanced digital services to uh, to citizens. So both the internal and external perspective of IAM is, is important. And we see a number of states that have, in the last couple of years, rolled out statewide initiatives creating uh, enterprise identity services for their citizens. And so that's very, very promising to see that. And then finally, CIO is broker and just the development of the evolving and new operating model. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And that really is the continued evolution and movement from what we have called the owner operator model of the past several decades with uh, with IT within the state CIO organization to much more of a collaborative partnership with the CIO as broker. And you'll see that reflected in some of the data uh, that I'm going to present here in a moment. Uh, and again, data management and data analytics maintain is in continues on the list. So a couple of things that are interesting before I move on. Number one is that consolidation and infrastructure optimization actually drops off the list. And it was in a number 11 slot, very close, but it's for the first time in more than a decade, it's not on the list. And for several years, early on in, in the history of the top 10, it was number one. So that has, again, I think part and parcel to the, the maturity and evolution of the CI organization that that has become just simply something that they're they're doing and has not become a priority uh, except for a few states. And the other is budget and cost control, which had been on the list perennially until the pandemic. Uh, and I think with the current fiscal conditions of the majority of the states, a budget and cost control is not a significant priority for the CIOs. I suspect that it's cyclical and we'll see it come back. Uh, so anyway, that's the top 10. Uh, and with that, background, let's talk uh, certainly about something that all, uh, everybody always asked me about the state CIO transition. So I thought I'd give you the uh, the current uh, heat map for those that are keeping score at home. Uh, 2023 was a record year in terms of the number of transitions coupled with only nine gubernatorial uh, election transitions. So that was very strange that we only had nine new governors, a number of incumbents were reelected, nine new ones, uh, yet we ended up with 23 transitions during calendar year 2023. Very unusual. Certainly, uh, I, I could probably go back and replay what I said in January of 2023, and I think I probably said there would be between 10 and 12. So just like uh, the weather forecasters and the meteorologists, we don't have to be right but more than half the time. And so uh, with this forecast today, uh, I will not make any prognostications for 2024, but I suspect it will be much lower uh, we've already had one transition uh, in 2024 with the uh, retirement of Dickie Howes of Louisiana, longtime uh, CIO down there over eight, uh, over 10 years, in fact. Uh, and then just recently, the announcement uh, from Ed Toner in Nebraska that he is retiring uh, in the next few weeks. And so uh, Nebraska will also be uh, shaded in for 2024. So if you look at the last two years, last two calendar years, a pretty phenomenal uh, transitions instead of churn with uh, 13 in 2022. So we're now at 37 states, new state CIOs in the last two years. Pretty remarkable run. Uh, and the, it really brings down the median uh, tenure right now. Median tenure is less than 20 months, about 19 and a half months. And so we'll we'll probably see that remain steady for a while until we get some more stuff. We've got a little bit of geographic uh, dispersion here going on. The West seems really solid and a lot of movement in the Midwest. And certainly you look over here in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic states, we've had a lot of changes. And two of our most senior uh, state CIOs with uh, Connecticut and New Hampshire uh, holding uh, those spots. Uh, Mark Raymond in, in Connecticut with over 12 years of tenure, uh, certainly a long legacy in, uh, in, in Connecticut. 
So just quickly, let's move through this ranking, some of the top uh, impact of the state C organization. Again, this is from our national survey. And uh, again, this is the forward looking. We wanted to see over the next three years and coupled with uh, certainly the top 10, you see pretty obvious connections between the digital services and cyber and modernization. Again, all themes we talked about uh, in that in that top 10. So those are gonna be uh, th where they see the most significant impact to their organization. What we also see in terms of the business models and the, again, customer service models, and many of you know that CIOs are the, the central IT service delivery uh, organization for their state government and for the executive branch, and, and they all work under some type of chargeback or fee-for-service model. Uh, what we've seen is, is some change in that. We're seeing more general fund dollars going to the state C organization, but we also see shifting to the CIO as the business leader of IT, more strategic, more around the, the kind of the vision and the overall enterprise governance. And you see that reflected in this question where, you know, remarkable 96% said that, but their role is going to be a strategic direction and policy setting. And you see the move to the the CIO as broker. So again, more partnerships with the private sector, more outsourcing, uh, more managed services. Uh, one of the data points that really surprised me in this set from 2023 was uh, almost half said they're going to increase IT employees in the next year. Uh, that is uh, fairly significant given some of the data we've seen in the past where that was generally a 10% or lower. So a big shift. And I think part of that is the recognition of the need for those capabilities and disciplines of kind of within the, within the state. So we're seeing a growing need. And that we'll talk about that in a few moments because that's a very challenging uh, issue. Uh, I'll mention citizen services and, and the enhancement of the digital experience for the citizens. And I'll, again, I'll use just a couple of, of data points from our uh, recent study that was put out uh, as our presidential initiative in October. And again, this was a lot of forward-looking activities, including a call to action for the states to improve in a number of areas. Uh, and those are summarized here. And that is really just giving them a, a blueprint or a roadmap on what they should be doing based on a series of interviews and also a review of the current literature and the studies that we had uh, or, or taken over the last years. This was based off our 2001, uh, pro, uh, pro, pro, 2001 initiative uh, that NASIO put out uh, around improving citizen experience and, and creating a citizen-centric government. So 20 plus years later, we looked at that uh, and tried to reflect on those recommendations and where the states had made progress. And there were a number of areas where they have, there's still a number of areas where they need to work on that. And a, a big part of that is embracing that no wrong door model. Uh, they'll need identity and access management uh, services to do that. And one thing states do not do is they don't promote our marketing. And that was a big gap that we identified in the current study was the fact that states are not marketing their availability to their citizens. And so, quite frankly, they don't know that the states are delivering, in some cases, hundreds of services digitally that they can take advantage of. And so there's going to have to be kind of a mind shift uh, for the citizens as well as the state agencies to promote the fact that they are providing some really enhanced digital services. Uh, so we're seeing states that are really going to move uh, more aggressively in that space because that's what their citizens and their taxpayers are are uh, are demanding from them. So that's some of the areas look at. And, and AI is going to play a role in this and already has on a number of states. We're going to see AI services uh, supporting a lot of these digital services uh, more expansively in the, in the future. Cybersecurity could not do a briefing today without talking a little bit about cyber. You see some of the top priorities as reflected by our states. Uh, including moving uh, to a more centralized and optimized operating model. We're, we've already seen that in a number of states, adopting a whole estate uh, cybersecurity resilience model. Uh, we, we've talked about that in a number of our studies, and that includes working more closely with the local governments, particularly on the uh, second year implementation of the state and local uh, cyber grant. That's $1 billion over four years. We're in the second year of that. Uh, there's still some things that need to be worked out. There's still some kinks in that. Uh, but many, many states are in the in the deployment mode for those funds, and they're providing shared services to their local governments and in partnership with uh, with them. So we're going to see hear more about that over the next couple of years, and we will continue to advocate uh, for more uh, federally directed funding around cybersecurity for state and local governments because of the relationships, particularly state governments have as agents of the federal government. So again, uh, cybersecurity will remain a very, very prominent 
uh, as, as CIOs remind me, this is just something that uh, in, it is involved in all of these other priorities as well. It's embedded in all the other discussions. Uh, and so it's something that it has to be addressed uh, because it creates a significant risk to the continuity of state government. Uh, so CIOs must obviously address that through their plans and through their uh, reducing that risk through uh, their strategy. So that's very, very important. Uh, this is a good synopsis of uh, what the CIOs told us, uh, their concerns about risk. Ransomware uh, has, has moved up to the top of the list. That's particularly uh, acute in the local government in the K-12 through sector. Uh, state governments have been relatively immune from major ransomware attacks. Uh, we've seen a number of those uh, at the local in the K-12 through level and nonprofit and hospitals. State governments have had a, a few, but nothing as dramatic or expansive as we've seen in those other as other sectors. And that, again, th most of those attacks are coupled with uh, human error, coupled with employer contractor failure to follow uh, basic cyber hygiene. And so we're going to continue to see those challenges. And you see where uh, they, they believe they're going to spend, uh, invest the most and also receive the most attention, not surprisingly, endpoint detection and additional cybersecurity awareness training. Uh, all the states have cybersecurity awareness training, but uh, they don't all mandate it. So I think we're going to see more of that in the future, either through regulation or through legislation, uh, where states are going to mandate that all employees and contractors must uh, have cybersecurity training and, and, and on a regular basis and not simply make it as an offering, uh, but make it as a requirement. And we're going to see, I think, more and more of that in the uh, in the states. Uh, so a uh, Big topic, as you saw, the top topic was around the talent crisis in cybersecurity. This is not only within cybersecurity, but across the IT ranks uh, in state government in general. It's been exceedingly difficult to recruit and retain uh, IT professionals. Uh, certainly, the, there's been a post-pandemic challenge uh, with that. And again, this is not only with IT employees. I think it's across the board in state government as we speak to our colleagues and other associations, whether it's emergency management, whether it's accounting and auditing. Uh, they're all they're all challenging. They're all they're finding these challenges recruiting and retaining a talent into the to the state pipeline. It's in some cases the pipeline is actually drying up uh, for those positions. And so states are competing with the, the private sector and the federal government for this talent, and they're finding it increasingly difficult. So what are states doing? You see some of the options here. Uh, the operative word for a number of these things is flexibility. I don't always see flexibility in state government in the same sentence, but that's what we really look at is you know, offering hybrid work, remote work, uh, borderless hiring. We're going to see all of that, and we have seen that among the states. They are going to have to really transform their old models into one where they're more accommodating to the potential to get candidates. They need to obviously uh, streamline the hiring uh, system uh, that they have today. The hiring process is too elongated. They need to collaborate more with the private sector and their higher education. Uh, we see a number of states that are raised salaries. And I think one of the most transformative pieces that we've seen uh, both through executive orders with uh, I think now 13 or 14 states is that they've eliminated the degree requirements for most state government jobs. And you see here that 45% uh, of our respondents indicated that they had eliminated degree requirements for some of their technology positions. We particularly see that in cyber. Uh, we have a number of states that are really hiring from the community college level and looking for certifications. So a four-year degree is not going to be an impediment or barrier to entry in terms of the state uh, workforce in that cybersecurity space. So this is uh, this is very important. So let's wrap up real quick and certainly talk about uh, artificial intelligence. Here's a few of the things that are really trending uh, that we are tracking and certainly we'll see in, in 2024. I mentioned uh, focus on improved digital services uh, tied for number one uh, in, the, in the priorities of the state CIOs, uh, growing cloud adoption, uh, growing software as a service adoption, particularly called lines of business. Uh, five years ago, we didn't see a number of states that were really looking for, for software as a service solutions for things like HR, procurement, uh, uh, financial management, tax and revenue. And we've seen a number of states just in the last couple of years move to those uh, third-party off-premise software as a service uh, providers to move to things like tax and revenue. That's something that wouldn't even have been considered five or six years ago. Uh, more, more business process automation, use of chatbots. And I mentioned the workforce and we'll kind of end talking about a couple of policy issues. One, 2023, we saw a fairly significant increase in state policy 
uh, and state legislation around some of these topics around data privacy, AI. Uh, uh, we had a number of states uh, that 18 states that actually passed legislation or resolution around AI adoption within state government. They're concerned. They're not in the regulatory mode yet as much as they are in the kind of defining the direction mode or asking questions around the use of artificial intelligence and generative AI within state agencies and trying to reduce the risk uh, by addressing some of these questions. A number of them have formed uh, task forces, study committees. Uh, they've created the requirement that states get a baseline and provide some type of of a documentation on catalog of those AI uh, use cases within state agencies. So they're focused on some of those. And we're see that in the legislation. Uh, we currently have, I think, six or seven states uh, right now, early in 2024 session that have already have draft legislation or legislation introduced that uh, is going to create a study committee or a task force like a number of states uh, did in 2023. So this is going to grow. So what's the what's the focus on AI from the state CIOs? Well, you can see a fairly dramatic jump uh, in interest. Uh, this is a question that we've been asking for almost a decade in our state CIO survey and asking what what emerging IT area will be the most impactful. And again, this looks the forecast for three to five years. AI was a small slice uh, on this donut uh, chart about five years ago. It was a really more prominent to see IoT uh, and to see some of the others. We've had quantum computing on here. We've had blockchain on here. We've had uh, a number of emerging topics uh, that have that slice has continued to decline. But you see, based on these two, we, we deliberately separated Gen AI uh, from the from the stack of, of artificial intelligence and other automated intelligence services simply because we saw such an interest. And you see uh, I'm glad we did that because it was, it was dramatic to see the interest in that. And coupled, you have 83% uh, uh, that have the AI stack as the being the most impactful. So we've already begun our journey last year in NASA with the creation of our, our, our uh, task force, our working group on uh, generative AI. And we've been, uh, that group has been meeting every month and looking at state examples and we'll continue to do that. But we've also looked at, you know, what are the business processes? And we have, uh, multiple studies starting in 2018 where we kind of looked at AI within state government. And again, the focus continues to be on enhancing uh, digital services and improving process uh, processes and operations within uh, within state agencies. Uh, many states are already using AI capabilities in their cybersecurity, particularly in threat analysis and detecting anomalies and looking at logs. Uh, th those are that's going to continue and expand. Uh, it's going to be have to be supplemented by trained employees. So that's another challenge that states are going to have. When we asked the states and CIOs about the major challenge that they have around AI adoption, uh, first and foremost, by a wide margin, was workforce skills and capabilities uh, were the major barrier that they had to address. Uh, that certainly plenty of technology to acquire, but they're concerned about the the uh, the workforce skills. That need to be developed in order to support the uh, the AI services. So you see these other areas. Uh, some of them are already in play. We have states using AI, particularly in areas like fraud prevention and in, in, in HR, and those will continue to uh, to increase. And then finally, uh, with uh, with all of that, uh, just wanted to point out. Uh, we again, there's a number of uh, four national studies that. Uh, and ASIO has been involved in since 2018 around AI in the states, which list a number of the use cases, number of the challenges, both pre and post pandemic. And we saw significant growth in AI capabilities and utilization during the pandemic, particularly at the low end of, of kind of machine learning and, and AI enabled chatbots. Uh, NASIO released uh, about less than a month ago a, a blueprint uh, for for states that were developing policies around AI. And again, this was designed to be a comprehensive uh, research paper as much as it was to be a start. Again, give them a kickoff with a blueprint to say, based on what we were seeing and what we've seen across a number of states, that these are the 12 key considerations, kind of a dozen things that you need to look at as a state government when you're crafting your AI policy, your framework, as you're uh, really embedding this in your enterprise architecture across the executive branch. These are all these areas that should look at uh, that they might not have uh, considered. And I think part of that's going to be what they're going to put in their procurement uh, processes in, in the future and what they're going to do about their workforce expertise and, and training. Uh, what we often hear from the legislative body is they're concerned about ethical use. They're concerned about privacy. They're concerned about 
uh, biases in the data and the data quality. And I think all the state CIOs understand that. So uh, those are, that, again, this can be downloaded off the uh, off the NASIO website, along with all of these reports uh, that I mentioned. All of these are freely available to you at nasio.org on our research uh, resource center. So I invite you to go take a look at those and look at the previous uh, studies, particularly on AI, because we're going to be certainly focused on that. That's going to be a top of mind issue for uh, technology, I think, both in the state and local and particularly the federal sector. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alan, because I know he has a, a lot to say about uh, about AI. And uh, let me stop sharing here, Alan. Great. Well, thank you, Doug. And yeah, it's worth repeating. All the information you just saw from Doug is all available on the NASIO website. It's a place I go to for, and tell my students, this is just a wealth of information, great reports. And of course, at PTI, we also uh, have all the information and reports on our site as well. So let me share my screen. And for those less familiar with PTI, let me just uh, state that uh, we're kind of like the, uh, the NASIO, but for cities and counties in the country. Uh, so. Um, this is our outlook. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of parallels between what you just heard from Doug and what we're seeing at the city county level. So yeah, we're keeping the theme of forecast. Um, I recently going to come back to this when we talked about AI, and we're going to end with AI just as Doug did. But I normally do an article for America City County where I identify 12 predictions for 2024 and AI starred in all of them. So this is an interesting article you might want to take a look at. We've been writing about artificial intelligence for cities and counties uh, almost from day one when suddenly out of nowhere, uh, not just AI, but chat GPT and generative AI really uh, took um, center stage and has captured our imagination. And it's so fast moving. So I'm going to share with you information from three studies that we did all last year and two of them uh, in the last quarter of last year. So it's it's pretty current information. So when we asked the city and county survey uh, respondents, you know, what are your what is your outlook for the next two years in terms of priorities? Obviously, cybersecurity is number one. Um, we didn't have a tie. Uh, cybersecurity is number one, but clearly between NASIO and PTI, cybersecurity has been number one for over a decade. It's how we, in some cases, if we put other words, it, we would probably have something cyber related, one, two, and three. Um, modernizing outdated IT systems. This has kind of moved up a little bit. Um, we didn't see this right away, but I guess uh, less money was put back into systems. Doug mentioned how things uh, form in cycles, and maybe this is catch up, but there's a recognition um, that systems are outdated. And of course, uh, what makes systems outdated is all the new uh, products that are out there that are replacing systems at a much faster pace. Number three, they identified innovation. And of course, innovation, a term that is, I think, always kind of misunderstood. It's about doing things differently. And so I think CIOs are stepping back away from the traditional task of just keeping the lights on, running the networks and protecting the networks, but looking back and saying, how can we better support the lines of government? Uh, how do we better align and kind of pull together our thinking and our resources to provide better services to the public? Number four, it remains IT workforce recruitment and attention. About five years ago, it was number 11. We're finding that uh, a lot of folks are retiring. I think that's true across the board. It's getting more difficult to replace uh, the knowledge that is walking out the door. Uh, so recruitment and retention uh, becomes a, 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 a real challenge to this day. Uh, launching or updating digital services for citizens. Uh, this wasn't on the list maybe four years ago. It is certainly now. There's a real emphasis uh, on how do we improve things. Much of this came about as a result of the pandemic, where we were really forced to confront the reality that we need to be prepared. We've got to compete um, with the perception that the private sector is doing such a good job. Now, sidebar here, I'm not sure that's true. Um, if anybody's ever tried to go off of menu with Amazon or any other services, trying to find somebody to provide help and assistance is nearly impossible. And I find customer service um, with airlines and the like is very, very challenging. I actually believe that local governments are doing a much better job, but that's not necessarily a perception. Number five, launching or updating digital services for citizens. Again, this focus on citizens, 
migrating systems applications to the cloud. Yep, we're still doing that. But part of that is the word applications. I think you're going to see more and more IT managers realizing they don't have the staff capacity. Um, they have aging equipment. And it makes sense at this juncture to move more of their operations into cloud-based operations. So for those in the MSP world, this has got to be continued good news for you. Uh, number seven is addressing integrating desperate systems. Um, as we try to develop enterprise solutions, this becomes something that's uh, far more important. How do we get systems to better harmonize with each other? Uh, addressing data silos, we know the information is out there, but how do we kind of get this under one tent? And with the growth of AI, data is the foundation of it all. So this becomes particularly important. And then obviously streamlining the procurement process. So these are the top issues um, that we identified in our 2023 city and uh, county national survey. When we asked, um, how's your budget outlook for the year? Uh, again, this was earlier part of last year. Um, quite a, well over half said that they saw an increase of 5% or more. Uh, a little over 30% said an increase of 1% to 4%. Uh, and you can see about 11%, 12%, no change. But unfortunately, a few did see a, a decrease of uh, 1% to 4%, which is, is both surprising and sad. The second survey I want to share, just the highlights here, is our 2023 uh, Cybersecurity National Survey. This was released in November of last year. So it's pretty current. One of the things we're always interested in is how are elected officials engaged or not uh, with cybersecurity efforts. Clearly, there's a correlation. When people are more engaged and they understand what's really going on, they're much more supportive with budget requests and doing the things necessary to make sure the right policies are in place. Unfortunately, 67% remain somewhat engaged. Now, these are perceptions and from the point of view of the IT professionals. I suspect if we asked the elected leaders, what they thought, we might have a different answer. So it's kind of all in the definition, but this is a troubling number. Um, only 23% are very engaged and 10% are not engaged at all. It doesn't mean that they're not committed, they're just not engaged. We asked, is your cybersecurity budget adequate to support cybersecurity initiatives? And the answer is no, 64% said no. So here we see budgets are increasing, but so are overall expenses. But when it comes to enough support for cybersecurity initiatives, 64% uh, said no, and 36% 30, uh, said yes. When we look at priorities, again, again, cybersecurity, uh, developing better strategies, doing better risk assessments, uh, developing more strategies and workarounds for malware detection and mitigation, uh, moving towards multi-factor authentication, you would think that we would have more of that, but apparently there has been some pushback from some. It can be expensive. It's not just something you just turn a switch. Um, zero trust uh, comes in at number five. I think people take it seriously, but when you look at what it involves, there are a lot of moving parts of that. And finally, for the first time, uh, RPA gets into this. Now, I know NASIO has been tracking RPA uh, for a number of years now, but robotic process automation coupled with artificial intelligence is starting to gain a lot of attention in terms of maybe we've got to automate more of these things uh, because we don't have the staff, we don't necessarily have the expertise. We asked an important question about the CISO or equivalent. And this is an interesting question. 52% um, of local governments across the United States said they do not have somebody that is either the CISO or equivalent. Only 48% said yes. But I have to say that in my experience, I'm going to guess that 70% of all city and counties do not have a qualified CISO. So the good news is they're increasing the amount of uh, people that are in charge of, of cybersecurity, working directly with the uh, CIO. But in terms of certifications, of which there are many, what we're finding is that there are people in these positions but they lack the training, they have not had the opportunity, nor have they been encouraged in some ways to get those certifications. And certifications in my mind are critical because it keeps people current, keeps you on your toes. You cannot just designate somebody who said, you're in charge of cybersecurity without making sure they have the training and the background to support that. So I would say when it comes to city and counties, a good 70% 
do not have a certified CISO. And this, to me, is a real problem. We have to ask the question, as we do every year, how would you rate your relationship between your organization and your state's IT organization? 60% um, said fair, 24% said uh, 24 said poor, only 16% said excellent. Doug and I have talked about this for, oh my gosh, probably since we began. We have always advocated on both sides. Um, how can we improve relationships between the local government CIOs? And it's just the structure doesn't seem to support it in the way that um, uh, that would uh, help foster these relationships. It's not that people don't care, and it's not that people don't try. It's just the one to many and all the re other responsibilities put on the one. Uh, we do have some ideas of how to change that, but it's not going to happen overnight. So for the first time, we did an AI and local government survey. This came out in August. Uh, we've never done one on AI, but because of its uniqueness, we thought this would be something worth exploring. Of course, no surprise, almost 58% said they believe that AI will have uh, an amazing impact in local government operations and service delivery over the next three years. 42.31 said, no, little change. And um, nobody said no change. So they were divided between dramatic change and little change. But I suspect that if we did this question today, that the dramatic change would probably increase. When we asked our members, you know, rank order the issues as they see them, that most concerns them when it comes to AI, Ethics was number one, and then unauthorized release of personal identifiable information, perhaps by uh, carelessness, was number two, and wrong and harmful decisions based on perhaps altered or false data uh, was a very close third, followed by misinformation and disinformation, and then bias, redirection of valuable resources, and then copyright infringement. So it's interesting. This kind of tracks a lot of national surveys that we've seen. And when we asked them, whoop, excuse me, when we asked them, um, where do you see cyber, uh, artificial intelligence having the greatest role? Cybersecurity management, data analysis, citizen engagement, uh, predictive analytics and crime prevention, better decision making, better uh, health care through predictive analytics, better planning, crime prevention, transportation, and budget and finance. So it's kind of interesting how these were uh, ranked ordered. So now, I go into the crystal ball and I finally found the digital crystal ball. And I just wanna share a couple of additional things with you. And then our hope is to turn it to you, the audience, to ask your questions. So we ask that you put them in the chat and we will try to respond to as many as you can. So some of the things that I'm seeing is AI is everywhere. In fact, one of the questions we asked our members is, would you be interested in having a training course on AI for yourself, possibly your staff? Over 80%, and we had the highest return rate of any survey with this AI survey, 80% plus said they would love to have training for their staff, and they said, and for me. So that's something that we are certainly working on. So you might want to take a look at that. Something else that was not directly mentioned in the survey is this whole idea of CIO relevance. And so I wrote an article recently for Merrick City County talking about overcoming CIO irrelevance. Doug mentioned earlier in a conversation, we have so many chiefs, chief privacy officer, chief data officer, chief knowledge officer. We now have chief artificial intelligence officer, chief. We have so many chiefs. And there really is kind of putting a lot of stress on CIOs in terms of who does what. So I think we have to kind of refocus on governance who does what and where, uh, but it is uh, it is a difficult time for those who are CIOs at the local government level. So here are some additional predictions since this is a weather report. If I get 50% right, I'm good. 2024 is an election year. We're very worried about misinformation, disinformation, and IT is going to be a key ingredient in election integrity in all that denotes. So we see a lot of turbulence ahead in terms of people perhaps distrustful of many of our systems. And a lot of that's going to fall back to IT and or elected leaders who in turn are going to turn to IT and say, um, give me some data, give me some information. What are some strategies that we can conceive of to kind of rebuild trust among people, which is so sorely lacking? 
It's also going to be a year where we're going to continue to look at AI governance. Many, many cities, and I know some states as well, have spent a lot of time working on, on uh, policies and guidelines, and there's been debates, which comes first. Um, but the key here really is governance. Who has the responsibility? Who makes these kind of decisions and under what circumstances? So I think this is going to be the year where we're really going to be digging into AI governance. We also are going to see more AI in cybersecurity. AI was probably one of the first applications, but we see more of that based on conversations that I've had and talking with the vendor community that we need to have better systems to supplement, and I use the word supplement, supplement or augment what humans can possibly do. These systems are very clever, as we know, at looking at anomalies, looking at patterns, things that don't necessarily seem right, and they can do that in a microsecond of a second. Humans can't do that. We cannot compete with that kind of speed and accuracy. So clearly we see more AI in cybersecurity. At the same time, every time we have an advancement, there's always a countervailing force that can often be overlooked. We're concerned about AI aimed at disrupting government operations and systems. So while we're building AI is like, well, this is gonna be another part of our defense, another part of our strategy. Uh, I have a piece, you know, I've identified something like 14 ways AI can help with cybersecurity. And, and they're all very uh, kind of obvious, but they really make sense. But at the same time, criminals never sleep. Um, they're dreaming stuff up all the time. It's like a sophisticated game of chess. And so we're worried about the bad guys. If we woke up to the idea of supply chain intrusions, the same thing could possibly happen with AI systems that we become very dependent on. What if somebody is downloading an update to a local government or even a state government? We have to be extra careful that that data or that upgrade has not been manipulated. So supply chain will extend to the whole AI uh, environment. It's just gonna be harder to spot. And then finally, outsourcing growth. This is something that we see that's continuing. I've mentioned it for the last four years. Local governments are finding a number of people retiring. They're finding it very difficult to keep good people uh, and to attract good people. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But nevertheless, when you look at that kind of situation, one has to conclude that local governments, if they are going to continue to operate, have to turn to another source to provide those services. So again, I think this is good news for MSPs. And that is more information, more systems, more applications will be outsourced. And I see that occurring for the next year or two for sure. So MSPs will continue to fill a talent gap where possible. So I had fun. I'm putting together a book, Artificial Intelligence, a primer for cities and counties. It will be out uh, in early spring or mid spring. And um, appropriately, um, the cover design that you see was actually generated by, uh, by artificial intelligence. I just have this vision that we overlook the fact that data underlies everything that we do. Without that, um, these generative AIs uh, are not very smart and not very intelligent. So I envisioned all this data sitting there. And I've been fascinated with the wisdom of octopuses and all their arms and sucking in all this information. That's all I use to describe. And this is the outcome. So it's kind of impressive. If you've ever played with designing art, it's kind of fun. And before I close, I want to remind you, we do a podcast, Shark Bites, that comes out every other week. Um, and if you have a story to tell, case study or something interesting about your career. We're always looking for people to interview. We're all ears. So we would be very interested in talking with you if you have something. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Doug, and and uh, I guess we'll open it up to uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shark. Uh, let me get uh, situated here, get back uh, in front of the camera. And, and we've got a few questions in here and a, few, a number of comments as well, which I've been uh, tracking just very quickly while you were going through your marks on, uh, on AI. And you were right. We talked about a lot of chiefs. Uh, so a lot of, lot of chiefs going on. Uh, and, and you mentioned one I see is uh, we've already got a couple of states that have appointed a chief AI officer. And I certainly see that. So we host the community of practice for the state uh, chief security officers of CISOs, as well as the uh, chief privacy officers. We now have, I believe, 25 or 26 
couple of new ones on board. So about half the states have an enterprise uh, chief privacy officer. Uh, 32 states, I believe, maybe 33, with the addition of Hawaii, have uh, chief data officers now. And again, they, for the most part, the majority of them report to the uh, to the CIO. But that's, again, I think that's the mix we're going to see in the future is it's not necessarily always on uh, the appropriate uh, to have those individuals and in those leadership positions have come up through the, the CIO organization report that that's just been by default uh, more than by design. So we'll, I think we'll see those shifts in the future on the uh, on the chiefs. Clearly, the chief architect uh, majority, I think all but three of the chief security officers report to the CIO, and I don't see that changing dramatically, but we will see some chief, uh, some chief, uh, uh, you know, kind of chief architects. Uh, a couple other questions in here um, about uh, AI and uh, where the state CIOs are. Uh, they, they are they they have been uh, given a lot of direction by legislation and by executive orders, and so they are probably given the strategic lead. But it's not always coming out of their organization. We've seen a number of states, most recently Pennsylvania, issuing executive orders on AI. I'm sure that was done um, in consultation with the state CIO. Uh, they will have the lead on the execution. They also will be an important part of the number of states. Uh, that already have AI task forces or AI study committees. It's a mix. Some of them are external and they are actually uh, appointees by the governor with uh, folks from academia and also industry and others are study committees within a legislative body. So it's kind of a mix across the states, but they're all focused on that. And I suspect by the end of the 2024 session, we will see even more of those created. So I see the state CIO playing a, a key role uh, in the in the leadership of that because they they do have their pulse on the again the executive branch uh, executive branch agency so that we're going to see uh, more and more of uh, of that. Uh, other questions we have on here, and let's see. Uh, yeah, I think Chris asked questions around whole of state cybersecurity strategies. I mean that is the focus uh, of the states and particularly of. Uh, uh, the states that have uh, both applied for and accepted the state and local cybersecurity grant, uh, that one of the five uh, major uh, er areas of emphasis is uh, developing a whole of state policy. NASIO has been talking about this for years, uh, talking about that necessary uh, collaboration with not only local governments, but, you know, special districts, K through 12, higher education, healthcare, uh, that, that, it kind of the consolidation of those groups that are all at risk and need to be having this discussion. And it can't be a state. When you talk about state government, it can't be, it has to be state. And I think uh, we're seeing a number of, uh, of states that are really embracing that and have done a really good job. I think it's just going to take time. And as you mentioned, Alan, it's uh, part of that is even with the funding, which is uh, clearly not more, more, that's not even adequate across the the 50 uh, states and territories, even with that funding, it's going to take a while to develop uh, that relationship and, and expertise, uh, because quite frankly, so many of the local governments that are a huge disadvantage uh, with their, like, as you mentioned from your data, I mean, most of them don't have cybersecurity expertise. Many of them don't have a plan. They don't adopt the framework. So it's a heavy lift. Um, and many of the state CIO organizations don't have a specific directive. They don't have a mandate to serve local governments. It's something to do as an offering. And so that business model that they're operating as can be really constraining to that whole estate strategy. I totally agree with that, Doug. Let me um, try a different way of answering that from my perspective. Chris artfully put the word tricky relationships. They're yes, not yes. bad relationships. They're not bad. It's not like, I don't like these people. It's like, I don't know how to reach them. I don't know who they are. I don't have a relationship. And I think that's the missing piece. That's what makes it tricky. The second thing is, and this is going to be a hard one. Um, when that cyber grant program, you know, billion dollars over four or five years was announced, many local governments were led to believe that they were actually going to get direct money, especially when 80% was supposed to be uh, dedicated for them. And of course, the reality was, given the, uh, the timing uh, the pressure to do something as opposed to nothing. In the end, um, states kind of reinterpreted that and uh, basically said, yeah, we're going to give you, the, it's going to be for you, but it's going to be by way of services. Um, that's 
that has caused a, a little bit of heartache for some of the local governments who feel somewhat betrayed. I think there's a lot of p politicians that went home after they passed that three years ago and thought, we've we've helped local governments. Uh, I'm not sure that's the case. Certainly, I think in many cases, the money will be well spent. But I'm seeing some really interesting models. And I've been advocating this for a long time. And Doug, you may have others, but I'm impressed with what Texas has done and doing uh, by creating all these regional areas, I think 20 plus, and they're not even finished yet, by identifying a strong player in each of these areas that they've identified. So they've taken the state, looked at the territory and broken it up in ways that are meaningful so that local governments and K through all these institutions can have some place to turn to that is kind of a distributed network. To me, that is what's necessary. It's not just the money. It's we need to have a policy and a structure that allows for this to be scaled appropriately. The CIO, even if they could reach everybody, the one to many doesn't work. I mean, you can't have, you know, 500 or 1,000 local governments calling one individual. So it's got to be a distributive network of people who understand the issues and have some kind of means of flowing up and down through the state. It probably needs probably needs to have some kind of high level coordinated, maybe a deputy to the CIO, state CIO, whose job it is, is to foster these relationships through these geographic regions. But I'm seeing the blueprint for this, and I know Texas isn't the only, but they were one of the first, if not the first, to do that. Or there's some others, aren't there, Doug? Or maybe I'm, yes. I had a dream yeah, about we, that. <laughs> we've actually, yeah, we, yeah, no, you're right. They're good as well as Arizona. We had Arizona speak at our our, our last conference on their model. Uh, I think you see a, a different model in uh, states like New Hampshire, which have a smaller geographic footprint and a lot of very small local jurisdictions. They went with the shared services model. So I know there was a sense of irritation by a lot of local governments, but I think if you're looking at the capabilities and disciplines, and the best use of taxpayer dollars, uh, the states have to be good stewards of those dollars because uh, they have to track subrecipients. So I think we could have a whole hour long conversation about what's going on with the grant, but I think each state has to take their own approach. And I think in mm -hmm. some states, delivering those things like cybersecurity training, it makes eminent sense for the say, we're going to provide cybersecurity training services and, and let the local governments consume that rather than each of them having to to spend uh, dollars because the the uh, trying to get that distribution out there, uh, the, the impact would be nominal with the with the amount of money each state is getting. So I think they've looked at it and say, how can we have the biggest impact? So I think there'll be lots of debates about this in the coming years before, you know, we are obviously going to going to advocate for the reauthorization, but perhaps with some different operating models to provide more flexibility. Uh, one size doesn't fit all. And unfortunately, that's really, they provide uh, generally only two paths for the states and many of the locals uh, are were not particularly uh, pleased with the fact that they weren't going to get a direct grant. But I think that was the, some of the decisions the governing bodies have to make. So we'll see how it all works out. Uh, but you're I agree. Right. Yeah. I think the sad part was the expectations. The rationale that you've yeah. described, I fully agree with. It's like, yeah. you know, what would you do if you were in somebody these shoes? And I see it. It makes total sense. But when you're promised something or it through whether it be indirectly or whatnot, uh, it's all about managing expectations. And I think that was done poorly right. by the feds, not by the states, but by the feds. Well, and that was more with the elected officials, <laughs> quite frankly, yeah. not uh, friends at CISA. Uh, mm -hmm. I see a question here for you, Alan, about uh, what outsourcing models are you seeing um, in, in, in local governments in addition to using MSPs? I'm not sure how to answer that other than the what I'm hearing from the CIOs as I travel is the obvious one is to um, have certain help desk functions, for example, being outsourced, may, maybe level one and two, uh, augmenting uh, the existing staff. So help desk is one. Uh, moving to cloud operations, a lot of this is definitions. You know, someone said, well, that's not outsourcing. But to some, if you're moving an application uh, that resided on premise and now suddenly you're moving that particular infrastructure slash application, then that's another thing that I see happening. Um, yes, they're turning to uh, outside providers to provide training because I think the in-house training uh, with the best of intentions uh, does not uh, come close to what some of the companies uh, that we know uh, can produ uh, produce. So almost any function that you see in, uh, in government, and in my case, local government, they're looking for ways uh, to maximize things. And I think one of the triggers of this, notice, 
you know, number two or three was uh, IT modernization. What's triggering that is end of life of equipment. And that is a time when people have to really make a decision. If they're reaching the end of life and they say, we've got two years and there's going to be lack of support or no support, that is a, a trigger point to start making some important decisions. People are looking at real estate today and they're saying, well, you know, we don't have the same office space requirements as before. People are working hybrid. Um, do we really need to have a data center? So I think almost anything that a government does, if someone can come in there and say, we can do it better, now there's a big if. Now, I know when I talk about this, some local governments get nervous, say, wait a minute, should I be looking for a job? And the answer is no. Um, someone's got a management uh, on site. Someone's got to manage the contract. Someone has to have a relationship with them. And let me give you one case in point. Uh, I've been, I was fascinated to see a city in Georgia. Um, they were all over the news. They got lots of national attention, Sandy Springs. Uh, they were part of Fulton County. Uh, bragging rights. You can still go on YouTube and see all this great things. They hired one major company to be the prime contractor. The only thing they maintained was their public safety unit intact. Everything else was outsourced. And they call it the government that outsourced everything. I was there two weeks ago and it didn't work. And so now they're building a city hall. Now they're bringing stuff in. Um, there's got to be a blend. And a and I think what Doug said, and I think it's an important word, partnership. Outsourcing does not mean, thank you, goodbye, I'm relieved of my responsibility. And what got uh, this group in trouble was that the, the people who were contract employees didn't have, they weren't beholden to anybody. You know, they were independent contractors. So they didn't feel for the city. They didn't feel for the citizens in a way that an employee might. If we look at what happened in San Diego, both the city and the county, they outsourced IT and now they're working in hybrid models, bringing it in or kind of a, you know, you have this, but we have our people there, all sorts of innovative things. So going back to what Doug said, it is the partnership between the private sector, the vendor community and us. And I just want to make sure people understand, you can never delegate responsibility. Yeah. yeah and you don't, I, I, we say that all the time. You can't, you don't outsource your risk and you got to focus on risk. And that's a good segue actually to, for me to mention the, the updated NASIO strategic plan for 24 to 26, uh, just adopted by our executive committee and released uh, a couple of weeks ago. And for the first time in almost 20 years, NASIO changed its mission statement. Mm -hmm. And that mission statement reflects what Alan just said, which is really focused on trusted collaboration and partnerships. We really wanted to highlight and recognize this evolving business model where that future in, in the state IT arena is really going to be about this CIO as broker model, uh, you know, like a, a new operating model with uh, collaboration, partnerships, business relationship management with, with the private sector is going to be enhanced. It's continue to grow. Uh, we already see it playing out in many, many states that have begun to look at that. And as you said, data centers, one example, uh, mainframe, we have, I think, almost 15 states now that have uh, either outsourced or moved to the cloud off-premise for their mainframe. So that's a, something that states would have not even envisioned 10 years ago that that's what they would have been doing. But it's uh, it's happening today. Uh, Alan, we've got a couple of more minutes here. Uh, let's see, AI seems to be a big topic. I'm trying to summarize some of these things. Uh, advice for state government organizations. Uh, again, I think that uh, part of it is to uh, is to balance and to be and to be moderate on on this discussion. Governance is critical in all of these discussions, but it is absolutely essential with AI because you're going to have multiple parties, and we're seeing that. So I think the major issue for states is to really kind of look at our blueprint because it's focused on areas, particularly around data quality, data you know, bias, uh, uh, inappropriate use. Those are all going to have to be uh, uh, re reviewed through a risk framework, but it, there needs to have overarching governance. Uh, and I think that's going to be important. Otherwise, you're going to have individual state agencies off uh, and running uh, with with AI without that appropriate guidance framework. So they need to really stay in the swim lanes on that. The other question was about um, the, the Gartner hype cycle, I believe, uh, that uh, Gen AI is at the peak of inflated expectations right now. And so who knows when it'll be driving down to the trough of disillusionment. Uh, but there will there definitely will be some hiccups. There will definitely be some major challenges. We, we would expect to see some issues. I know, uh, speaking to the legislative uh, group uh, just in December uh, at their national conference, 
One of the major concerns that they have is around uh, election uh, deep fakes and election synthetic media. And we have a number of states that are passing legislative uh, actions uh, during this session uh, that's going to prohibit the use of those and make campaigns disclose through transparency if they're using any kind of synthetic generated uh, imagery or video. And we certainly expect to see that from uh, from uh, the, the bad actors that they will be uh, be using AI to disrupt the elections. We have 11 gubernatorial elections in 2024, so not a large group. But again, with the presidential elections, I think we can see lots of that. So I could just jump in. We noticed uh, that the presidential election in Argentina partially was swayed uh, by uh, fake uh, fake videos and the like. I personally do not uh, accept the word that AI is hype. Uh, I believe it's embedded in everything that we do. It's not going away. And so I really stay away from the word hype. That This is totally different. It's going to be in everything that we do. The uh, it's it's our, the train has left the station. It's going to be in every word processing, every laptop, every car, every washing machine. I mean, it is here. Now, whether governments use it or not, you so at peril, but we're only talking about the fourth generation at this moment. Imagine what generation seven or 10 is going to look like. It is getting wiser and smarter. Machines are learning much more than we are every day. <laughs> so stay tuned for where we are next year. Yep. We'll be coupling quantum computing with AI capabilities, and, and that'll be uh, what we're seeing on the horizon. We've exhausted our time, uh, Mr. Shark, as always. Uh, lots of uh, good questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but uh, uh, again, appreciate uh, the attendance, a large attendance of all of the, our folks today and taking time to uh, listen to us again, do a, a forecast. So don't hold us to the to the mm -hmm. forecast, just like the meteorologist. Uh, we'll see. But again, expect uh, uh, a, a lot of adoption of these uh, of these tools we talked about today and continuing challenges around kind of the public policy discussions in state and local government. Alan, any part of remarks? No, I look forward to it. And we'll hopefully we'll do one of these mid-year as we've done before, which is a little bit more chat oriented. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for the, uh, the next time we get together. Yeah. All right. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day.